All right, good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Uh, youth, you guys are dismissed, and elementary kids, you guys are dismissed as well, and as, and as well. Pastor Chris is over there waving at everybody. Everybody else, this is a phone. This is the silent switch on the side. If you need help, the youth can help you on the way out. Just wave and the youth will show you how to silence your phone for the day. I would not ask you to turn it off because I know none of you will. So leave it on, but push, push, put it on silent. So um, with that said, so good to have you here on this Memorial Day weekend. And of course, far more than just enjoying a long weekend, it's an opportunity for us to remember and really to honor those. I mean, we live, uh, safe to say, we live in the best country on this planet. And uh, it did not come cheap and it was not free. And all of the freedoms that we enjoy were paid for by those who, uh, who really did sort of make that ultimate sacrifice. And we owe them a debt of gratitude um, that, uh, that this day is set aside to just remember. So remember that as we, uh, as we go today. And of course, as you celebrate uh, doing something hopefully that's fun tomorrow. So let's pray and just really ask the Lord to bless uh, his word this morning as we're here uh, together. So. Father, we thank you so much, again, just for the freedoms that we enjoy, Lord, and we thank those who did make the ultimate sacrifice, Lord, and pay the ultimate price, Lord, to help to preserve and to um, just to get us those freedoms, Lord. We know ultimately that our true freedom comes in Christ, Lord, but politically, Lord, and in terms of human governance, Lord, we are so thankful for this country. We are so thankful for the freedoms that we enjoy, Lord, and though our system, of course, isn't perfect, Lord, we, uh, we thank you for it, and we thank uh, you for those who've helped to earn it for us and preserve it um, for us, Lord. And so we pray this morning as we go to your word. Lord, that you would give us understanding of uh, yet another um, important chapter, Lord, of this book as we look at your plans, Lord, for the future, Lord, of this planet. And so we pray that your spirit would give us understanding, Lord, that the teaching ministry of your Holy Spirit would be manifest here today, Father. And we pray as we do each and every week that you'd give us ears to hear what your spirit would say to your church Lord, give us ears individually. Lord, give us ears collectively. Lord, we want to know your heart. And we ask these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So with that said, turn to Revelation chapter 8. And over the past couple of weeks, if you've been with us or watching along with us at home, you know that things are starting to get messy. Or things are starting to get cleaned up, right, depending on your perspective. And in chapter 5, you remember we were introduced to that seven-sealed scroll, which we said was the title deed to the earth, which only the slain Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, was found worthy to take and to open, right, to redeem this fallen planet. And as we've watched these seven seals be loosed one at a time, as God's final plan for this planet starts to be sort of unrolled. And remember, we started back in chapter six with that first set of what are appropriately, appropriately called the seal judgments. And these are those judgments that, that are going to occur likely during the first part, the first three and a half years of the tribulation, very likely immediately after the church, after we are raptured to heaven to be with the Lord. And we're starting to get a prophetic picture for what will really be the beginning of the end. And very quickly, remember, there was that first seal, which was the introduction of the Antichrist, right? That final uh, world dictator who will come to power peacefully, but that peace won't last long. And then we see the second seal is war and the third seal famine and the fourth seal death. And through these, we've seen that a, a full quarter of the world's population is going to be killed just in those judgments. Remember the fifth seal was those martyrs, the souls of those martyrs that we saw under the altar. Those were those people who'd been martyred for their faith during the tribulation time, the sixth seal kind of ended with this sort of cosmic chaos. There were disturbances in the heavens. There was an earthquake 
on the earth. And remember in the closing verse of chapter 6, those who suddenly find themselves on the earth at that point cry out and ask this question, who is able to stand? Who's able to stand under this wrath of the Lamb? And then last week, remember, we kind of paused in chapter 7. It was the first of what we'll see are a few of these kind of parenthetical passages that we find throughout the book where the action pauses and then we're given some additional detail on some specific subjects. And in chapter seven, it really answered that question, who is able to stand? We were introduced to those groups of people that are gonna be saved during that tribulation period. Those who will be able to stand in the face of that judgment. Remember, there were two groups of redeemed people. There were the sealed Jews, the 144,000 Jews. We talked about them probably being God's chosen missionaries to carry the gospel all throughout the world. Remember, it's a 144,000 little apostle Paul's kind of running around. Then there was the saved multitude. And this multitude, 34,000 was kind of running around. Then there was the saved multitude. And this multitude, probably in large part, the fruit of the labors of the 144,000, they will all receive Christ during those dark days of the tribulation. So now as we move into chapter 8, right after our kind of parenthesis of chapter 7, we're going to see that the opening of the seventh seal introduces the next series of judgments. It introduces the seven trumpets, which then will lead us into the final set of judgments, which is the seven bowls. Those seven bowls definitely are poured out during that very last three and a half years, that period called the wrath of God or the great tribulation. And this morning, we're going to see the devastation that comes to the earth, earth just as a result of the first four trumpets being sounded. But I think we're also going to see some great encouragement for all of us, because we're really going to get a look at how the Lord continues to limit his judgment and really his wrath even during this time. So following the opening of the first six seals, we have at the beginning of this chapter another brief pause. It's kind of the preparation in heaven for what's about to happen on earth. And it starts with this very ominous silence. Look at verse 1 and 2 of Revelation chapter 8. It says that when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. So it's like we've been waiting, right, for these seven seals to finally be opened. We see them, you know, loosed one by one. But when the seventh seal is finally opened, the end doesn't immediately come. And instead, the seventh seal sort of sets in motion these seven angels who are now standing there ready to action, each one of them having their own trumpet, which they're going to sound one by one. And these angels and these trumpets are going to play a major role now in the unfolding of God's plans. In the Old Testament, we so often see the use of trumpets. We see them, you know, trumpets used to sound an alarm for war. Perhaps they even throw the, uh, the opposing forces into a panic, right? Sometimes they call God's people to a holy assembly. And these seven trumpets specifically are kind of going to sound as God's battle alarm during the tribulation. And yet before that happens, there's this spooky silence. It says for a whole half an hour, not a sound. Now this verse is a fascinating and it's a very important one and it has some very specific and some theological, you know, conclusions that are drawn from it. Again, silence in heaven for a half an hour. And we understand from this statement here in Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1, it has produced the speculation that there are no women at all in heaven because there was silence for... Now, I don't believe it. I don't believe it at all. 
I just want you to know some of the different interpretations that are floating around out there about these passages. I think about half of us here thought that that joke was funny. But remember, remember this, the Bible also, we just saw in chapter 7, the Bible teaches that there's going to be no sorrow in heaven, so that there probably aren't any men up there either. So, right, just a little humor, right? As we approach what is really a, a profoundly serious subject, because put yourselves now kind of in the midst of this heavenly scene. And remember, we will be there at this point. We have the Father on the throne. We have the slain lamb before the throne. We have those four living creatures amidst the throne. We have the 24 elders around the throne. We have this multitude of Christians from the church, right? Us. We're in heaven before the throne without number. Millions, millions, hundreds of millions. You have this multitude without number, he said, of people who became Christians even during the tribulation. And then there's this angelic host, which is singing along with the singing of the saints to the Lord. It was 10,000 times 10,000 and many more. So over 100 million angels. And there's this incredible assembly, imagine it, that probably goes out in all directions for miles and miles and miles, all of us worshiping and praising the Lord. And suddenly there is not a single sound for a half hour. And it's not like there was a countdown clock, right, up on a big screen somewhere, kind of counting down to when the silence was supposed to start. This was not an orchestrated thing at all, but there is something about the spiritual atmosphere of heaven moment that produces this response in all of God's creation. It is so heavy. It is so awesome that no one can make a peep under the weight of what is happening in heaven. It's just, there's an awe, there's a holy awe over what it is that God is going to do next. And I think that the Lord, as he stops all of the worship and all of the praise that's being directed to him by his creation, I am inclined to believe that part of what this silence really communicates is that while God is unapologetically holy and righteous and he is true in this judgment, that he takes no pleasure in the judgment that he is being forced to mete out upon creation in order that he could finally bring an end to the rebellion of men. And yet, he does it. He couldn't be just. He couldn't be righteous. He couldn't be God if he didn't do something about it. But oh, how he would rather be dispensing his grace to the world. Oh, how he would rather be extending salvation still to the world rather than judging the world. You remember in Ezekiel chapter 33, you remember that God spoke to the children of Israel through the prophet Ezekiel, he said this, he said, say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? And we've mentioned before, and we'll probably mention these verses again. Remember, Peter brings out this same thing by the same Holy Spirit in 2 Peter chapter 3 when he says that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness, but he's long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's what God desires. But because he is God, and because he is righteous, and because he is holy, he can't just want for that to happen. But one day he has to rise up, and he has to produce that in this fallen creation. And that's why Peter goes on in the very next verse 
2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, he says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. He will do it. He must do it. But not until, I think we see here, not until he's made it clear to all of the creation that it does not please him to do it. It does not please God to have to judge man. And so we have this silence. And it is a take your breath away kind of a silence. It's a sober, sort of an awestruck silence which will fall over this entire heavenly scene. Now that all of the seals are off, now that the scroll can be opened up completely and all are standing there in awe and in anticipation of God's plan finally and fully being able to unfold. But I think we also see as we move on that the silence is also a silence of supplication. Look at verse 3. It says that then another angel having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. And he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. So often in the Bible we see prayer and incense associated with one another. Psalm 141, it says, let my prayer be set before you as incense and the lifting of my hands as the evening sacrifice. And the idea is that just as incense is precious and it's pleasant and it drifts up to heaven, that our prayers do the very same thing. And we saw in chapter four that there is currently a heavenly sanctuary. We talked about the fact that actually the earthly tabernacle and the temple itself were just shadows. They were copies of what still actually exists in heaven. And here we have this heavenly altar of incense. Now this becomes the focus of the action. And all of this is imagery that we see throughout the Old Testament of the worship of God in the temple, temple and the tabernacle. A censer was basically just kind of a little container for coals. And the priest would bring that over to the altar as a regular part of the worship. The container would be opened up and they would place these live coals from the altar into it. So this is the, the holy fire right, that's coming now from the altar of God. And then another one of the priests would come with incense which they would then heap upon those coals and it would produce this sweet smoke, right? This sweet fragrance. And all of it was a representation of the prayers of God's people which would rise up to God and they were sweet smelling and they're pleasing to him. And so that's the same imagery of what's happening here. It's interesting just to think about our prayers and what this imagery tells us about the way that God sees our prayers. We know how we see them. We know how we pray them. We know that they're important to God. We know that he listens to our prayers. We know that they make a difference to him. And yet here, what this reminds us is that our prayers are a sweet smelling fragrance to him. That they bring pleasure to him. And I think that's a remarkable thing. And we see next that the way that we pray to heaven really does have an impact on the things that happen here on the earth. Because look what we see happen next in verses 5 and 6 with the prayers of God's people. It says in verse 5 that then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and put it to the earth. And there were noises and thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. And so the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. So here we see proof prophetically of the impact and the power 
of answered prayer because the prayers of the saints here are now hurled back to the earth. And what's the effect? There's thunder and lightning and an earthquake. It's yet another warning to the world that some trouble is definitely coming their way. Whatever we may think right, about the importance of our prayer, we need to note here that there is a very real sense in which it is the prayers of God's people that will set in motion the coming consummation of all of human history. We prayed, and here God will answer. What did we pray to make this happen? Well, we prayed the prayer that the saints have been praying for 2,000 years since Jesus taught us to pray. Remember in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9 that he said we're to pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Then what? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So this, the coming of the kingdom, is what the saints have been praying for since the Lord was first here 2,000 years ago. And so this prophetically, we see finally here in chapter 8, it's the answer to the prayers of Christians over the centuries. Every time we have prayed, Maranatha, right? Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Here are all of these prayers stored up together. You know, why do we pray that prayer every single day for God's kingdom to come and for his will to be done on earth as it is currently being done in heaven? We pray that every day, and yet sometimes things don't seem to change, but they will. And understand that every time you pray that prayer, it's being stored up. And it is a part of this incense that then is poured out upon those coals, touched with the fire from the altar, thrown back down to the earth, as those prayers are now mixed with the fire of God's judgment. So the holy wrath that comes as a response to our holy prayers. And it's about to be announced with the blasts of these seven successive trumpets as we start to see this desolation on the earth begin. Look at verse 7. It says that the first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. Now this may sound familiar because the first judgment reminds us of the seventh plague that fell on Egypt, doesn't it? Out of Exodus chapter 9, they had fiery hail. Remember, Egypt was the center of a godless world system. And so it is very fitting that those same plagues that we saw come upon Egypt in Moses' day are going to be repeated, but now on a worldwide scale, during the tribulation. Now, again, on the West Coast, we don't know a whole lot about this unless we're watching about it on the Weather Channel. And yet a hailstorm by itself can cause tremendous damage. Now we have fire mixed with hail. And we can just imagine the possibilities, right? The desolation, a third of the trees, it says all of the green grass on the earth are going to be destroyed just by this first trumpet. And I have to admit, as I pondered this this week, I wondered, how do you even mix fire, which is fire, how do you mix that with hail, which is ice? Right? And then if you're going to throw some blood into the mix. This just seems to me like it would be impossible. This would have to be something supernatural, wouldn't it? And that's exactly the point. Because many people have spent time speculating how these things will happen through different phenomenon that we can understand today. Maybe this is nuclear war. Maybe this is the fallout from that. Maybe this is pollution. It's climate change, you know, or, or so forth. But these are interesting and, and they're all possible. But none of that speculation should ever obscure the essential truth that it is 
God supernaturally who is bringing this supernatural judgment. God isn't just an innocent bystander. He's not just sort of letting nature kind of take its course. God may, certainly he can use whatever method that he wants to bring this judgment, but one thing that we know about the judgment is that the people on the earth at the time, they are going to know that these events are coming from the hand of God himself. They're not just going to somehow think these are easily explained away natural disasters. But we can just imagine, imagine we have a third of the earth engulfed in wildfire, right? A third of the forests, all of the grass erupting into flames all over the planet. Now, I feel like I need to take just a moment to mention, especially today, especially here in this beautiful state in which we live with our beautiful forests and the great efforts that people go to to conserve them and to preserve them, people very often will wonder at this kind of a judgment against the creation by what we claim is its own creator. We are absolutely supposed to respect the earth and we are to be good stewards of the earth, but please understand that God's heart is not set on this fallen earth. God is going to make a new heaven and he's going to make a new earth. And so when people can look at this earth and they can't see the creator behind the creation, actually, not they cannot, but they will not see the creator behind the creation. They will not see the designer behind the design. When that is happening, I believe that God feels very free to say, hey, if you can't see, if you can't receive the one single great message that my creation is intended to communicate, then I will feel very free to kill the messenger. Because I know that I'm going to create something that is infinitely better by the time this whole thing is done. So here we see that a third of all the trees, all the grass, destroyed by just this first trumpet. Verse 8 says that the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. So this takes us back to the very first of the plagues against Egypt, which is where all the waters turned to blood. You remember in Exodus chapter 7. The second trumpet affects the oceans of the earth. It turns a third of them into blood, kills a third of the creatures, and destroys a third of the ships. This massive burning object falls, right? Not a literal mountain. John says it's something like a great mountain. It's like John says, look, I've never seen anything like this. I can't say exactly what it is, but the closest thing I can do is describe this thing that I'm seeing as like a great mountain burning with fire thrown into the sea. And boy, that sure sounds a lot like a comet, doesn't it? Or some sort of a huge meteor, doesn't it? Something out of a Will Smith movie, perhaps, right? That's head of Bruce Willis or whoever is heading toward the earth about to, you know, cast from heavens into the sea and results into this tremendous upheaval, right? The biggest tsunami that you could imagine, all residual pollution. The blood here is probably, is either a cause or it's an effect of all of the widespread death that's going to happen throughout those oceans. Some researchers say that this kind of a phenomenon has happened on a smaller scale throughout the history of the earth, right? Resulting in great ecological upheaval and disaster. Now, honestly, when John talks about the sea, we can't be exactly sure which sea or whether he's talking about all the sea, right? Considering that water covers about three quarters of the earth. Now, for anybody in the Middle East, the sea would have been what? The Mediterranean Sea. And that may well be the sea that John is talking about it. And you think about the Mediterranean Sea as a center globally, right? A center 
you know, politically, especially the way it will be at this time prophetically, you think about even now today, the number of ships that are on that sea. You have military vessels from all over the planet crammed into that sea. And then you think about the cargo ships, all of the, the cargo ships that are transporting commercial goods to and from and through that part of the earth. And then you add in all of the pleasure vehicles, right? The cruise ships that are operating doing now. Granted, this is admittedly a bad time to be on a cruise, right? During the tribulation. Although there might be some great deals to be had, right? I'm praying none of you are here to take advantage of those deals. We'll take our footsteps of the Apostle Paul cruise before the rapture. You think about all the luxury vessels, right? The yachts, right? From Monte Carlo and the Italian Riviera, all of these kinds of ships. And now this fiery mountain falling into the Mediterranean absolutely could produce the destruction of easily a third of all of the ships on the planet. And yet, interestingly, it's just as possible to consider that the Atlantic Ocean alone covers about a third of the Earth. And estimates say that about a third of the world's ships are in the Atlantic region at any given time. So we can see again that a disturbance like this could very easily happen and could very easily create not only an ecological but an economic disaster. Verse 10 says that then the third angel sounded and a great star fell from heaven burning like a torch and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the sp and the name of the star is Wormwood. And a third of the heavens became warm wood. I'm sorry, a third of the waters became warm wood. And many men died from the water because it was made bitter. So following the devastation of a third of the world's oceans, now this third trumpet affects the rivers, right? makes them bitter. Again, we could very easily see this as some sort of a comet or a meteor that comes crashing into the earth and bringing this kind of an environmental disaster. One single star could very easily fall on a third of the rivers and the springs, possibly as it disintegrates, right? Entering the, the earth's atmosphere. It's also very possible, you think about you know, polluting the headwaters of a number of the world's major rivers, right? The underground water sources, it could very rapidly spread until a third of the planet's waters are undrinkable. The water supply is ruined, at least a third of the water supply on the earth. Now, what we're going to find out a little bit later is that during this period of the Great Tribulation, during the last three and a half years of the Tribulation, the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, while they are fulfilling their ministry there in Jerusalem, we're going to learn that they are praying, as Old Testament prophets did, they are specifically praying that there would be no more rain on the earth during that time. And guess what? There won't be. So, you have no rain happening, now you have a third of the existing fresh water supply destroyed by this particular trumpet. In other words, to find drinking water that won't kill you is going to be something very, very difficult. In Job it says that God calls the stars by name, and apparently this star has this curious name of Wormwood. Now, Wormwood was a, a bitter desert plant. It's mentioned in the Old Testament seven different times. And each time, it represents sorrow and bitter judgment. Jeremiah prophesied that one day Israel was going to have to drink of these bitter waters because of her disobedience. And certainly, historically, we have seen that this has been the case for the Jewish people. But now here the whole world, including Israel, is going to suffer under this same kind of judgment. And I really believe that one of the things that the Lord is speaking here in this judgment is that the sin and the rebellion of the world has left a terrible 
and a bitter taste in his mouth. It has left a bitter taste in the mouths of everyone in heaven. And now effectively, he's going to give them a taste of their own medicine, if you will, of what their rebellion and what their sin has brought into his creation. And I think it's beautiful that in contrast, we should always remember that as believers in Jesus Christ, that it's the cross of Christ that turns the bitter waters of judgment sweet mercy. And isn't that the beautiful picture that we see of this in Exodus chapter 15? Remember shortly after the exodus from Egypt and the people start to complain about the bitter waters. And you have that picture of Moses casting the tree which is a, a type or a picture of the cross, he casts it into the bitter waters and they become sweet. And it's only the cross of Christ that can turn the bitter judgment of death into the sweet mercy of God that actually brings us life. Look at just these first three judgments. It's like this full out assault by the Lord on the environment. You think about the 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 worldwide effects just on basic human needs. You've got food destroyed. You've got the distribution of, of goods crippled. The water supply is, is barely available. And yet we're going to see now that while these first three judgments dealt with the earth, now we're going to see the fourth judgment is going to deal with a third of the heavens, right? We've seen the desolation of the earth. Now we're going to see the delumination of the sky. Now, yes, I know that delumination is not a word. I get it. And yet you're going to see that it fits perfectly with what happens. In verse 12, it says that then the fourth angel sounded and a third of the sun was struck a third of the moon and a third of the stars so that a third of them were darkened and a third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. So just like the ninth plague that came upon Egypt, here this fourth angel sounds and it brings about darkness as one third of the light of the heavenly bodies is blacked out. Now, this could mean a couple different things. Some understand it to mean that sort of every third star is blacked out and that the, the intensity of the sun is going to be diminished by about a third, which, of course, would diminish the intensity of the moon. Others believe it doesn't describe sort of a third of the lessening of the light, but what it describes is that a third of the day and the night are plunged into darkness, sort of that the, the very cycle of day and night are somehow disrupted or somehow altered. Now, either one of these could be true, and either one of them is just as Jesus said would happen in Matthew 24. He said that the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. Whatever it is, something is happening here where the light is reduced by a third. And just imagine the implications of that. Imagine the way the climate is going to be impacted. Right? No more worries about global warming, right? The temperatures are going to drop instantly. And you think about the consequences in terms of this judgment on society as a whole, on top of all of the previous judgments, imagine the sense of a new terror that's going to fill the earth darkness, right? It's, it's not hard to imagine the way that sin and that crime and that terror are going to rule the streets, right? When darkness comes earlier in the day or when the night is even darker and it's even longer than ever. A good friend of mine always said, nothing good happens at night. And you look at the increase of darkness. Jesus said in John 3 that men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And again, this judgment is so righteous. It's as though God is speaking here to these people in their rebellion and he says, hey, you want darkness? You don't want to walk in the light? Okay, I will give you darkness. 
And it's exactly the same thing he did, of course, to the Egyptians, right? And he did it as a way to start to remove his righteous people from Egypt, which is a picture, again, of that world system. This whole scene, we imagine, after these first four trumpets, it's literally like one of those end of the world, everyone fighting for survival kind of deals. And so right about now, is the time that we probably need to ask ourselves as we try to imagine all of this. We have to ask ourselves whether these first four terrible judgments, should they really be understood literally? And there have been many who have suggested that maybe these are just more allegorical or somehow they're simply symbolic and they're simply spiritual. Well. Maybe we should ask Pharaoh how spiritual or allegorical the judgments were when they came upon him and upon Egypt. And the point is that if God could send basically these same awful judgments to Egypt during Moses' day, what in the world would prevent him from sending them upon the whole world during the final time of judgment. These 10 plagues were poured out on Egypt because of the Pharaoh, because of his hard-hearted rejection of God, because of his continued oppression against God's people, the righteous. Here in the tribulation, you're gonna have the Antichrist persecuting God's righteous people, right? The, these people who've come to faith in Christ during the tribulation, and now you have the Antichrist persecuting them just in the same way that the Pharaoh was persecuting God's people during his time. And so God brings judgment again in the very same way that he did then. There's no question that this is hard to read. There's no question these first four trumpets reveal the severity of God's judgment, the way that he attacks all of these ordinary things, food and water and, and sustenance. He attacks comfort and even the regular cycle of the, the regular rhythm of days. And these are all things that people have come to assume are all just these impersonal perpetual forces and yet it's almost as though during the tribulation God once again is going to proclaim that he's the Lord of all of those things. He's in charge of those things and he's going to proclaim it through disrupting them. And you think about the people of the earth, right? When the very things that they have come, you know, we depend on the sun rising at a certain time and setting at a certain time and the regular rhythms of life. And now literally the entire foundation is shaken. Literally things are falling down around them. And as I was thinking about these trumpet judgments, I think we can't help but make the connection with a beautiful story from the Old Testament and the fall of the city of Jericho. And I think that if we make this connection, I'm hoping that it's going to be an encouragement to some of us even this morning, even if there's just one of us here. But you remember in Joshua chapter 6, Jericho was this monstrous city. It was just across the Jordan River, and it had stopped up the progress of the people of Israel from crossing over and entering into the promised land. And you remember there were these huge walls of the city and they all fell over with simply the blasts of the trumpets of God alone. You remember that crazy story? The priests were given these trumpets and for seven days they all marched around the city blowing the trumpets. And on the seventh day they marched and they blew the trumpets seven times. And on the seventh blast the walls fell completely down flat. Now, as we study the Bible, in Bible typology, Jericho is another type, it's another picture of this present world. And of this present world and all of its estrangement from God and its hatred of God and of his people. And in this familiar Old Testament text, that city of Jericho and those walls fell at simply the sound of the seven trumpets. And it's a picture for us of this event we're studying this morning as the world system as you and I know it is going to begin to fall at simply the sound of these seven trumpets 
trumpets that are blown here in our text by these angels. And I know that sometimes for us, it may seem like there are these overwhelmingly tall walls standing in our lives today. They are these things that separate us and they prevent us or they stand in our way from really entering into the promised land or from really entering fully into God's rest and into his joy and into all of the things that he has for us even here right now. And these walls so often seem to us like they could never possibly ever come down. And yet what this chapter should remind us is that all of this present world is nothing more than a house of cards. Whatever that largest mountain, that grandest structure, the most complex economy, right, all of it is going to come crashing down at simply the sound of the trumpets of God. And those huge tall walls in your life that are standing in your way, God can take care of that this morning. Even with all of that said, what I want us not to miss, as terrible as these first four trumpets are, with all of their destruction, still God continues to reveal his mercy within the judgment. Notice that these are still only partial judgments. They're only partial judgments that affect a third of each of their intended targets. There are actually 13 different references to a third part in these judgments that we're reading about in chapter 8 and then next week in chapter 9. And what it reminds us is that though these six judgments of God are poured out upon the whole earth, look at the way that he continues to limit the destruction, the way that he continues to hold back his wrath so that only a third of each of those things is affected. Only a third of the trees and the sea and the fish and the ships and the river and the sun and the moon and the stars. And when we look at these judgments from this perspective, I think we need to be reminded that God indeed is still so gracious. And he continues still to exercise such patience with rebellious mankind. Each one of these judgments, when we look at it from this perspective, they actually are designed not to bring death, but to warn and to lead a rebellious world to repentance before we get to that point where the curtain finally falls. For now, Notice that God spares more than he smites. He could simply, couldn't God simply destroy everything with one word? Of course he could, but he doesn't. And what he's communicating is that as fierce as this judgment is, it's a restrained judgment. It's a measured judgment, and it's intended to wake up the population so that they repent. He could simply wipe them out completely, but he's trying to get their attention. He's giving them space to repent of their rebellion against him. And maybe there are some of us here this morning, maybe you are a little bit far away from the Lord. Maybe you're here and you're in total rebellion against the Lord. And you look back and you can see that something has happened over the last two or three months or maybe the past year or maybe it's even more and you see that God has wiped out a third of your life. Well, that's his grace. That's grace because he could have wiped everything out. And if you are walking in that direction, if you are taking advantage of him in that way, there is a reason that he has restrained and measured his judgment against you, and it's to get you to turn back to him. And what we know in our own lives and what we're going to see here in our text is that when we don't do that, things often only get 
worse. Because the thing we see next in our text, after these first four trumpets have blown, we've seen the desolation on the earth, we've seen the delumination of the sky, God now sends proclamation by an angel. Look at verse 13, John says, and I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet and of the three angels who are about to sound. Now, some would be quick to point out that the ancient Greek word for angel and eagle are very close in the way they're spelled. Some of your uh, translations may actually say that it's an eagle who's making this cry. Angel, eagle, potato, potato, tomato, to who really cares? The point is that this is a literal messenger from God flying through the heavens, giving a warning to the entire world that the next three judgments are going to be even worse than the first four. Understand, the world is absolutely in a shambles at this point, and God sends this angelic creature who comes in and says, in essence, he says, seen nothing yet in terms of what is about to come. And these angels' woes are well-founded because what we're going to see in the, our text next week is that another third of the earth's population is going to die during the next three judgments. And yet before that happens, there's another warning here. And I hope that you're as amazed as I am at the lengths to which, even during this time of judgment, the lengths to which God goes in order to try to get men to turn from evil and turn back toward him. And we could certainly hope, we would think, wouldn't we, that, that men would heed God's call, and yet surprisingly, it's not the case at all. We're going to see in the next chapter that the people are just going to harden their hearts. They will not repent. They did not repent, we're going to be told, over and over. And we're going to find that out as we continue in the study, but I think we get a clue just from the language of this verse. Look at that specific phrase there in verse 13, where it talks about the inhabitants of the earth. It's a phrase we're going to see seven other times in the book of Revelation, and it's significant because the sense of the language is that it refers not to those who live on the earth, but more directly it refers to those who live for the earth, right? The earthlings, right? People who flat out are rejecting heaven and rejecting the Lord Jesus in exchange for the comforts that this present world can offer. And maybe there's a few of us who at one time were right there with them. These are the people that Paul describes in Philippians chapter three. He says that their end is destruction whose God is their belly, right, their own comfort, and whose glory is in their shame and who set their minds on earthly things. And then in verse 20, he says, but our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, of course, it ultimately brings us to that fundamental question that everyone needs to answer for him or herself is my citizenship truly in heaven or do I still belong only to this world? What is it that really drives me and what is it that really interests me? What is it that I'm passionate about? Remember Paul said to the Colossians that Jesus has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the son of his love. We should be living in a totally different space than here in this world. We exist here, and yet we live in Christ. And we should live according to his principles of his kingdom, not according to the principles of the earth. And that should change everything, shouldn't it? It should give us new appetites and new desires and new behaviors. It should give us a living hope. It should give us a very different standard and a very different perspective because we know we are truly not of this world, 
just like Jesus was truly not of this world. And we're waiting for his kingdom to come as we started to see here. One more quick thing before we finish up this morning. I want us to look back just briefly at the beginning of our text because I think we're going to find just one more little piece of encouragement to take home with us today. Look again at verse 3. We're assured that God hears our prayers. We saw back in chapter 5, didn't we, that he stores up those prayers in special bowls. And here I hope this morning we've seen why. Right? He's keeping them so that they can be offered at the right time and according to his plan there in that beautiful silence and the hush of heaven. Right? Our prayers not only are kept to be offered at the right time, but look again at what it says next. That before the angel could offer the prayers to the Father, look what it says in verse 3. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints. And then and only then... It says in verse 4, did the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascend before God? And the point of the picture here is that it's only after our prayers have been mixed with the smoke from the incense that then they are offered to the Father because it's that incense that makes them effective. And the reality of this heavenly sanctuary is that the Bible says that Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of the Father even now where the author to the Hebrews says that he ever lives to make intercession for us. And so in effect, church, it's the incense of the intercession of Jesus that's what sweetens our prayers before the Father. Don't ever be afraid to bring anything to God in prayer. It's a throne of grace, and we can approach that throne because of Jesus. And we can expect to receive grace and to receive mercy from that throne in a time of need. Our prayers are fragrant to the Lord. He never misses them. He never fails to answer them. But sometimes, doesn't it, it feels like that one prayer just must have gotten lost somewhere out there, somewhere, on its way to the Lord. And the problem is that our prayers so often are polluted by our lack of perspective. We can't see what he sees. We ask for what we think seems to be good to us, when in reality the result of it would be disastrous for us. Aren't you thankful for some of the prayers that you prayed to God that he didn't answer? Those prayers that he said no to? So then Jesus takes those prayers, doesn't he? And he sweetens them up, right? He kind of perfumes them. He perfumes, he sweetens up those clumsy prayers of ours through the addition of the wonderful incense of his intercessory ministry. Why is it sometimes that we don't see answers immediately to prayer? Why is it sometimes we don't get the answers that we expect to get? It's because Jesus loves us. And because he knows better what is best for us. And I want to close today, appropriately on Memorial Day, with what's called sometimes the soldier's prayer. And it's very short. It was written by an unnamed soldier way back during the Civil War. And I think it's so appropriate. He says, I asked God for strength that I might achieve, and I was made weak that I might obey. I asked for health that I might do greater things, and I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need of God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I received nothing that I asked for, but all I had hoped for. My prayer was answered. I am most richly blessed. And I know that so many Christians throughout the ages have struggled 
with God's delay in answering the prayers of his people, right? Your kingdom come, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And yet I think what our text today shows us is that God will answer all of our prayers and he'll answer them as they're mixed with that sweet incense that only Jesus can provide. He'll answer them as they're offered according to his timing and according to his awesome plan in his perfect time. Amen? So Father, we thank you so much, Lord. We thank you for this text and we thank you for uh, just the great encouragement that it brings, Lord. Uh, an example, Lord, that even in the midst of your wrath, Lord, your righteous holy wrath as you have to pour it out upon this earth, Lord, we thank you for this reminder that even in the midst of that, Lord, that you remember mercy. Father, you desire that these judgments be a wake-up call and that they be something that lead people back to you, Lord. And so, Father, we want to pray for that same thing in our own lives, Lord, as there are areas where we may be suffering the judgment, Lord, uh, of you and we know that your intention lord is not to punish us for the sake of punishment but to lead us back to you and so we pray lord personally that we would be responsive to that and father we pray lord that as we look around that we would be able to encourage those who we see walking in the wrong direction lord that you are a god of mercy and a god of grace but that someday you're going to be forced to judge in righteousness and holiness. And so we pray that we'd help to communicate your love to them, Lord. And we thank you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.